thank you for being here for worship. Let's join us in just a quick word of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you now for this blessed time. We thank you for these who have come and publicly profess their faith in Christ. Thank you for coming into their heart and for the witness that they have borne by publicly coming forward. And now for this witness today of baptism, as they pass through the waters of baptism, may this be a wonderful and memorable time to them. May it be a time that they never forget as they live with you in their heart all the days of their life, as they walk by faith. Bless, we pray, in the matchless name of Christ, we do ask it. Amen. First, we have Lenny Claire Wascom, who came a few weeks ago and professed Christ publicly. She's had a wonderful summer of Bible school and camp and uh, Christ has saved her and she wants to come this morning asking for baptism in our church and so Lenny in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your public profession of faith in him I baptize you my sister Lenny Claire Wascom in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit buried with Christ in baptism raised to walk in newness of life. In similar fashion, Salem Harper Wilson comes today, having publicly professed faith in Christ, and she too is asking for baptism and membership in our church. And so Salem, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, Salem Harper Wilson, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Layla Ann Wingy. Layla, too, some time ago professed faith in Christ, and she made that decision public recently, and she, too, comes asking for membership by, by, by baptism today. So, Layla, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, Layla Ann Wingy, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk, in newness of life. <clears throat> this is John Maddox Johnson. John Maddox came a few weeks ago and he and I had a wonderful conversation together. He accepted Christ as his Savior, and he too follows in believers' baptism today. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother, John Maddox Johnson, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. This is Colton Keith Holmes. Colton came and professed Christ publicly. So Colton, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, Colton Keith Holmes, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life.
This is Kyle Daniel Pierce. Kyle was saved some time ago, but he says he never remembers being publicly baptized to follow his Lord in baptism, and so he asked to do that today and asked for membership subsequently in our church. So Kyle Daniel, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, Kyle Daniel Pierce, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Victory in Jesus, our Savior forever. And all his people say together in agreement, amen and amen. Good morning, church. It is good to see everyone this morning. And what a great way to kick things off here this morning at Gillsburg Baptist Church. Uh, it is, uh, as you can see, we've had a great summer. A great summer, and uh, and one I've been around for a while now. Um, this may be like one that I've uh, that we've never experienced here. So, uh, what a great summer, and uh, we still still have some time in our summer uh, schedule uh, with our Monday night uh, service tomorrow night. So, I want to remind everyone of our Monday evening service uh, tomorrow evening uh, at seven o'clock right here in the sanctuary. We have Evan Busman coming from First Baptist Church of Summit. He was one of the founding members of uh, For the King uh, with Brother Branson uh, that kind of started right here at Gillsburg, and he will be coming and leading us in music worship. He is married now uh, with, I believe, a 10-month-old. Is that right? Uh, so he's got some stuff going on at home, and uh, so he'll be here with us tomorrow evening to lead us in music. And then Dr. Evan Lino uh, from Mississippi College. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's there at Mississippi College, also has connections with the uh, New Orleans Seminary, and he will be coming to speak with us. Uh, he's from Clinton. His kids are actually already in school. I invited his family tomorrow night, but he said it's a school night for them, uh, so his kids won't be able to come, but he will be here. But that's tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. I want you to put that on your calendar and uh, invite folks. Uh, we're kind of tailoring it towards 7th through 12th graders, so all are welcome. It's going to be a service for everyone. We want you to know that. Uh, but we're kind of specifically going to try to hit our 7th through 12th graders. So if you have any uh, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, uh, another church that you're friends with, uh, please invite them to Gillsburg. We'd love to have them and have them here for that uh, evening service tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And there will be refreshments uh, after the service tomorrow night. Uh, all the kids uh, that have participated in our summer reading program, uh, those books must be returned today, and I can tell you from personal experience, if they're not returned, you will get a letter in the mail uh, about that, but those books should be returned today, and then we will recognize all those who participated in that program on August the 6th, which is next Sunday, so that's our summer reading program. I want to make sure, I've had a lot of questions about this, I want to make sure this is clear. Wednesday evenings, Wednesday nights, our midweek services will begin on August the 9th. August the 9th, okay? So you have one more Wednesday off, and then August the 9th we come back in our normal uh, schedule for August the 9th, and that will actually be the business meeting night on August the 9th. So just wanted you to have that in your calendar and be prepared for that. I want to remind you about our puzzle here, and the puzzle represents the money that's being raised to pay off our land purchase. Uh, so if you will pray about that and meditate on that, feel led to give to that. Uh, you can kind of see as our progress goes, I believe there's 268 pieces remaining if you want to give to that. Masters Men, y'all sing tonight, right? Six o'clock? Six o'clock at Pine Grove Methodist uh, Church. So if you want to go listen to the Masters Men and be a part of that, they will sing tonight at Pine Grove Methodist at six o'clock. Also want everyone to know that the nominating committee is still working. Uh, we are kind of running out of time. So we could use your help. Uh, there's several positions. I filled a couple this morning. There's still several positions uh, that we would like to kind of get confirmed um, before we present this at the business meeting in August. Um, would really like some help with homebound ministry, if anyone's interested. Um, we we kind of, 
incorporated this with Gillsburg Grub kind of in the past. You'd go see some of our members that are homebound. We, I think we have a magazine or some curriculum for them that you give out to them. And just kind of go see them periodically as you can uh, is what that's about. Um, looking for a Sunday school director. Uh, the Sunday school director, uh, a lot of people just think, well, all I got to do is take attendance on Sunday mornings. Right, Brother Dowden? That's it. Uh, but it's a little bit more to it. Uh, the Sunday school director will order the curriculum for all the classes um, and make sure that the, each class has the uh, right amount of curriculum that they need uh, for each quarter. Uh, they keep the records so that we can see what we've done previous years and what we're doing now. And uh, Brother Dalton, I know, would be glad to help anyone who's interested in that. He will help you. He'll show you how to make that order, how to do those things. So we're kind of looking for a Sunday school director. Uh, ages two through three. Two through three, it's an active group. Uh, we need a Sunday school teacher for them. Uh, ages two and three, Sunday school teacher. Uh, Sunday mornings, they have their own little classroom down here. Um, nominating committee members. Uh, these nominating committee members um, basically do this work uh, pretty much, uh, really, we should start earlier, but usually about May, we're kicking it off, May or June, and trying to get this done by August. And they are the ones that kind of seek you out, see if you want to keep your position, if you want a new position, if you want to move, etc. Uh, so anyone who may be interested in the nominating committee, if you're interested in any of that, please grab me at the end of the service and we'll try to get that uh, tidied up. I'll just be honest with you and be frank with you. I work in a bank and in the banking world you try to be efficient. So if I can't find people to handle these things, we will cut them and combine them and whatever I have to do. So please pray about it, meditate on it, and if you feel led to serve in any way, shape, or form, uh, please seek me out after the service. I want to let you know our Sunday school attendance this morning was 87, 87 total, and adult three had 16. Adult three had 16, so they're showing out uh, today. So that is good. We appreciate your faithfulness in, some, in the Sunday school hour. Also, I'm sure you saw as you came in, if you didn't want to point out to you, the August calendar is now out. Uh, a lot of dates on there have a uh, women on mission meeting, uh, brotherhood meeting coming up, senior citizen fellowship. Um, so you'll want this calendar. Uh, you'll want to see what those dates entail. Uh, so pick this up on your, on your way out today if you haven't already uh, gotten one. Any other announcements that I need to make this morning before I get down? If not, I want to welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. Uh, we are so glad you're here. Uh, we want you to know that you're always welcome to be here and worship with us, and we're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, we also want to welcome you to our service, and, uh, and we're so, we appreciate your faithfulness in watching us each week, and we can't wait for that day that we can all get back together in person and worship with you. I will tell you a story because my job is to stall this morning, which for those of you that know me, you're probably a little worried. But every time we have a baptism, I think about the story I read. I read it in one of the books, uh, one of the Duck Commander guys, you know, Duck Dynasty guys' books. They talked about how they baptized one guy one time, and he was in the water, and he, he, had, he couldn't swim, and he was scared of the water. And when he went down, just out of just, you know, instinct, he grabbed the glass with his left hand, and that hand didn't go down in the water. Well, the preacher and the people that were baptized didn't think nothing about it until that guy showed up years later and said, I'm worried I ain't going to have that hand in heaven. We need to dunk the hole. What, take me all under. So I'm just telling you, if you're thinking about baptism this morning, when you get up there, don't grab the side. We need to take you all the way down, bring you all the way back up, okay? <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> if not, we just, again, it's so great to see everybody. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. What a great way to kick things off this morning, and I am going to pray real quick, and then Brother Doug will lead us in song. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you, and we're just truly grateful for our day today, uh, to seeing uh, these people get up here in front, in front of everybody and show that they are now, they have now turned their life over to you, Lord, that you are Lord of their life, and they're making it public, and it's on video, and people have seen it, and there's pictures of it, and, and man, what... Um, what greatness we see in that. And we just exalt you, glorify you, and lift you up. It is nothing that, that uh, we have done uh, here at Gillsburg. It's all been you, Lord, and we lift you up 
and thank you for that. And we just pray, Lord, that each and every person here, Lord, in this community, in this church, will help these young folks, help these young Christians uh, on, in their walk with you, Lord, uh, throughout life, that we won't forget about them, that we won't just baptize them and let them go um, and, and be, uh, be happy with that, but we will continue uh, to fellowship and to mentor and to help these young folks uh, that have just been baptized this morning. We just ask, Lord, you keep us safe as we worship you this morning. Keep us safe as we depart here and bring us back here safe and sound tomorrow evening for our last journey in July. Uh, Monday in July service uh, tomorrow night. We just ask you keep our guests that are traveling in, keep them safe and get them here safe and sound, Lord. And now we just turn this service over to you, Lord. We lift you up and glorify you and magnify you, Lord, and we just thank you. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What a great scripture to go with a baptism this morning. Second Corinthians is thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Let's praise him for our, through our love. I look, thank you, Lord, and I love you, Lord. Let's stand for a call to worship. for him. At this time, we normally have children's messages, and we're going to not have that today, but we will dismiss the children and go to Miss Jennifer so they can go over there to Children's Church. I'm going to do something unusual. I'm going to let y'all be seated, and we're going to sing the next song. Y'all sitting down, so y'all make sure y'all remember this. I did you a favor today. So children, as we sing these songs, if y'all would be dismissed and go to your Children's Church, I will sing the wonder story and blessed assurance.
pray. Our Father, we thank thee for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for the souls that were saved this morning, baptized, and, and according to your word. <clears throat> Lord, we ask that you be with our military as they protect us against all invaders and just protect them and bring them home every each and every day. But we ask that you be with our uh, police officers, give them the courage to continue to go out each and every day. Lord, we pray, pray for our country. It seems like they're just going the wrong way. We just ask that you take a hold of it and lead it back to where it needs to be. Lord, we thank you for the rain that we blessed this community with this past week. And like normal human beings, we always asking for more. But we just have to be with Dr. Vic as you as he brings your message this morning. Go with us through this week. God, guard and direct us. We ask in thy name. Amen. Amidst the hustling, clamoring world, sometimes it's hard to hear the voice of God speaking to my soul. But in my quiet time alone, when I reach His holy throne, His tender words fall gently on my ear. He still speaks, I know His voice, sweet as sounds never heard by mortal. Makes me rejoice, he still speaks. I know his voice. There are so many who still doubt that God can speak today. They laugh and mock when we say we've heard from God. Yet the still small voice of God is heard above the doubting of this world. It's time his words ring out with hope today. He still speaks. I know. still speaks. I know His voice. He still speaks. He still speaks. I know
people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Doug. What a, what a wonderful thought that is, you know, as we come to worship today, that the God of all creation may speak to you and to me. That's, uh, that's worth coming for and worth asking for. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Thank you for being in, in worship at Gillsburg this morning. We've been looking over the last few weeks at a question that we have we've asked and uh, tried to answer. It's very simple, just two words, can God, can God. So I want you to turn with me again this morning. I know we've looked here before, but this gives to us a basis for so much of our thinking. The ninth chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. You remember these first verses, and I'll not read them to you again. We'll begin reading there in a moment in about verse 10 following. Because for some reason, when we think about the Apostle Paul, we leave out this last part of, of his story. And I think it's, it's important because I, I want you to think with me this morning about that question again. God can or can God? And today, I want you to think about this. Can God use your life? Can he use you and me? We've talked about it from, from other aspects, but I want you to look at this thought this morning. Can God use your life? In the 20th century, particularly in the last half of the 20th century, Southern Baptist evangelism was practically dom uh, den uh, dominated by, by one guy. There are many evangelists in our convention. Well, there was a man who lived during that time named Freddie Gage. Some of you probably heard him somewhere. I was privileged to work with him on a couple of occasions. Freddie Gage's story is, is one of the most fascinating I think I have ever heard in all my life, Freddie Gage, it is said, impacted more than 50,000 churches during the time of his ministry. Seventy different denominations. You see, he would preach to anybody, anywhere, anytime about the grace of God. He'd preach on a street corner. He'd preach in a church. He preached in huge stadiums to packed out crowds. He preached in prisons. He preached in schools. And he would tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Freddie Gage, it is estimated, won over a million people to Christ in his ministry. A million people under his leadership. Now I need to tell you <laughs> the rest of the story. He was the most unlikely preacher or evangelist I believe I've ever met. And I think you would agree with me. Absolutely. You just cannot imagine. He was loud he was bold, he was brash, he was impetuous at times, and, and always colorful. Even in his later years, when I came to know him, he, he still hadn't gotten over being that way. He was a constant witness for the Lord. He never stopped wherever he was. But see, you have to understand some things about Freddie Gage. He was born in 1933 in Humble, Texas, near Houston. He was born in the charity ward of the local hospital there. Largely raised by his grandparents. And by the age of 16, he had a huge reputation on the rough streets of Houston, Texas. He was at 16 years of age 
a reputed gang leader, well known and highly regarded on the streets. He was also, at 16, a confirmed drug addict. Freddie Gage had a nickname. His nickname was the Cat. That's what they called him on the street because he was also a cat burglar. That's how he supported his expensive drug habit. Miraculously, somehow, at age 18, Freddie Gage came to know Christ and was saved. And he spent the rest of of his life until just a few years ago, winning folks to Christ with his powerful personality. He had a, a powerful presence, whether he walked into a room or walked into a stadium filled with people. And he had a stock in trade line that he used in nearly all of the, the times that he, he stood to speak. He would say this, all my friends are dead. All my friends are dead. Now the reason he said that was because it was literally true. Many of his friends were actually physically dead because of drug violence, because of gang violence on the streets of Houston, Texas. He had lost many friends, but the rest of his friends, for the most part, were spiritually dead, and he knew it because they were without Christ. They were, they were lost. That's the way any of us are, apart from a relationship with Christ. I, I think, without a doubt, his most unlikely witness for Christ that I've ever met Maybe with the exception of the Apostle Paul. We're always amazed when we read the story of Paul in Acts chapter 9 gives it to us. Now you go back when you have opportunity and read these first verses. But I want you to read with me <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 verse 10 and following. This is after Paul's Damascus Road experience. And Paul, you remember, was struck blind after he saw that vision and saw the Lord himself. He said, it was him. It was the living, resurrected Lord. I saw him. And he, he was blind for three days. He went into the city, and, and there they had a place for him, and, and some instructions came. And this is where we pick up the story there. He didn't eat or drink anything. Verse 10 says, now there was a disciple at Damascus. That's where Paul was headed. Named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I, I've heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And Ananias is saying, are you kidding me? For I will show him how much she must suffer for the sake of my name. So, verse 17, Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales, fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus. Did you see that? And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He 
is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Here in this most interesting story, I think every time I read it, I'm even more amazed than before. We think about someone like, like Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, and, and that's when we really come face to face with the statement that, that grace is truly amazing. And, and we've, we've looked over these last weeks. Can God really save you and me? Yes. Can he save us? How? By his grace. Can God really keep us safe? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. The answer has to be. Can he really save our loved ones? Yes, he can. In grace, through faith. Yes, he can. And today, can he really use my life? There's no greater illustration than Paul, maybe other than Freddie Gage. Can he really use my life? I know some of you right now as I speak, and you're listening to me, oh, Please, don't, don't, let's don't go down that road again. Let's don't hear that. I don't want to hear that again because I'm the most unlikely candidate. <laughs> I just gave you two that will beat any of you in here twice. The most unlikely. Can God really use my life? The Apostle Paul, you know what his stock in trade was? Fear. Everybody was scared to death of him because he was the meanest guy around in the Christian community. God reached down to Paul because he can. In grace, Saul became Paul, and God saved him, and he used him to change the world. You know how I know that? Because here we are thousands of years later, and we are still using his story. You ever think about that? God did such a work of grace, that story has persisted, and we still talk about his brilliance and about how God used him to change the world and write so much scripture, and his testimony continues even to this moment, this day. We quote him probably only second to Christ himself. Now, I want to tell you, Paul wasn't some kind of gilded super saint. He just wasn't. He had so many difficulties, but God reached down. He changed everything about him. He changed his life. He changed his direction. He changed his outlook. He changed his ministry. Everything. And some of you are still asking the question, and you're still saying right now, he can't do that for me. He just, he just can't do that for me. And I say to you, yes. He can. Yes, he can. He can do that. No, you say, you don't know. You don't know the barriers. You don't know the obstacles in my head. No, I don't. But he does. He does, and he can. I just want to share some quick things with you from the life of Paul. And I want you to think about this. First of all, I want you to think about some personal conditions. Was Paul's personal condition significant? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. What was his past condition significant? Yes, it was. All he tried to do most of his life was put Christians to death. Do you think that's significant in the sight of God? I do. I mean, I can't imagine that. First Timothy, Paul said of himself, he said, I'm a murderer. I'm a thief. I'm a rebel against the Lord. Acts chapter 7 says he gave the approval for the murder of that good man, Stephen. Not only that, he held the coach while they carried out that deed. Paul said, I, I'm about as bad as good. But inwardly, he was the worst of the worst. Outwardly, he was the most religious man of the day. He was the best of the best. He'd been in the best schools. He was as religious as anybody could possibly be. A, a Pharisee, but grace, grace changed everything when Jesus came into his heart on his way to that Damascus experience that day on that road Saul became Paul and nothing 
was ever the same. Everybody here today is just like that. You are exactly like that. Or you can be because God can change your heart. Even in this service before we are done today. John chapter 3 calls it a, a new birth. We talked about that at length over a couple of times. Let me just cite you two or three other examples. Remember the apostle Peter? Peter denied Christ at least three times. Three times denial of the Lord. And do you know that it was after that that God used him mightily? He preached his greatest sermons and had one of the greatest churches in the early church. What about Moses of the Old Testament? Moses was a murderer. And God used him mightily in his later years. What about Samson? Samson sinned against God, but he slew more Philistines in his last days before he himself died than he had all of the days of his fighting beforehand. Abraham lied to God. Abraham lied to God, and yet God later used him as one of the greatest fathers of the faithful. And then what about Jacob? Jacob was a deceiver and God transformed him and used him. And my, there, there are so many examples like this. Do you know, as you sit here this morning, every one of us here, there are three records. There are three records of our deeds from the past. One you carry and I carry in my mind. The second one is carried in the minds of your family, maybe your friends, let's say those that know you. And the third one is carried by Satan. Now what about these three records? One in your mind, one in your friends and family, and one in Satan. Well, you can remember your past. I can remember my past. Most of us can do that. Your family and friends can remember your past as well. They remember what they know about you. But, oh, Satan remembers every bit of that. And he'll throw it up to you constantly. He'll use it against you in every opportunity, in every way. He'll come before you. Oh, you're going to trust God. You're going to serve him. You're going to get religious on me all of a sudden. Ha, I know about your past. And every opportunity he will destroy you with your past. But there's one more that knows everything about us. And that's God. And God, because of what our scripture tells us, God says your past is not an obstacle. Because when you come to me in repentance and faith and you trust me and I say to you I have forgiven your sins, your personal condition becomes clear before God. Oh, that's so hard for us to believe. That's so hard for us to see. That's so hard for us to come to terms with. But your personal condition has been forgotten by God when you're covered under the blood of the name of Jesus. Secondly, what about your personal circumstances? Your personal circumstances. There are many here today who are like Moses we talked about a minute ago. Some of you would tell me real quickly, oh, Brother Vic, I, I'm too old. Do you know that Moses was 80 when he really started being effective for God? God called him at 80 in Exodus chapter 7, Exodus chapter 4. Uh, he was not eloquent. He was not a great speaker. It also says there that he was fearful and he was afraid. It also says in Exodus chapter 4 that he was 180 degrees in disagreement with God. He said, God, I'm too old. I'm too much. All these other things. And God wouldn't have it. God said, I want to use you for my glory. And he did. Man, when we start to roll call of the faithful, Moses would be at the top of most any list. What about the, the Gadarene demoniac? Guy that lived in a cemetery. You remember him. He, he harmed himself. He was mentally ill, and no chains could hold him. He had unusual strength. He broke every chain that they tried to bind him with, and everybody feared him. Who, who laid claim on him and straightened out his witness? God. God. God took him and, and healed him for his glory, for everyone to see. What about the four lepers? I preached an entire message about this about this, in the book of 2 Kings. Four lepers. 
the most unlikely people you could think of in 2 Kings chapter 7. And God used them to save all of Jerusalem because God was glorified in that. Unbelievable. God knows all about us. But do you think this morning he is surprised by your circumstances? I don't. I don't. He is not surprised by our circumstances. Romans chapter 12, that's why Paul wrote these words. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God. This is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and Perfect. Paul in Acts chapter 9 was very busy. He was busy doing the worst deeds he possibly could. He was on the way to Damascus and literally he had a hunting license for Christians. That was what he wanted to do. He wanted to find them. He didn't care if they were men. He didn't care if they were women. He didn't care if they were children. It didn't matter. He was filled with hate and with destruction. Do you think he's an unlikely witness? I think everybody would hear say about as unlikely as I can imagine. And yet God changed him. Paul had the worst amount of baggage that we could possibly imagine. And some of you say, well, I'm the same way. I don't have any education. I don't have any resources. I don't have very much faith. My faith is pretty weak. And others we look at and they're so arrogant. They're filled with pride or filled with drugs like Freddie Gage. Well, you say, in no way God could use them. But he can. God can do it. God took Paul in the midst of the worst present circumstances, and he is still using him today. Is that amazing or what? I mean, it is. So personal condition, personal circumstances, you may have used both of those. What about personal characteristics? Acts chapter 9, verse 13. Did you miss this? Ananias said, I'm scared to death of this man. Lord, I've heard many things from many people about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints. And Lord, isn't there somebody else? Because I'm scared to death of this man, Saul. I don't have anything to do. You know that some of them thought that Paul's conversion was a ruse. They thought it was a trick. They said, this is nothing. Paul's going to be a Trojan horse. He's, he's lying about this. He really hasn't changed. He's still black on the inside. He's still dark in his heart. All he wants to do is to be able to get inside the church. They thought he was a trickster. And when he got inside by, by pretending to be something that he was not, he was going to say, aha, I found the chief priest. I found the guy I was really looking for. And he was going to take them captive, put them in chains, and take them back to Jerusalem and persecute or prosecute them, whatever. That's what they really believe. Let me get on the inside. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, when he went to Jerusalem, he had to take Barnabas with him. When they went to introduce him as a new convert and they were going to speak to the elders at the church there, he had to take Barnabas because they were so afraid of him. And Barnabas had to go and vouch for his conversion and tell them what had happened. But I want to tell you, According to the scripture, Paul, the apostle, was frail in other ways. Not because of the baggage, not because of the personal characteristics, but he had some other things. This has been a matter of debate for years. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, it says his bodily presence was weak. Now, nobody really knows exactly what that means. Paul says of himself, he said, my speech is of no account. He was a poor speaker. Some say Paul was, was small in stature. He was short. Some say he was just ugly. <laughs> he wasn't much to look at. And that was a detriment to him. But we really don't know. But, it, but his bodily presence was weak. That's the, what the best translations say. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 said he was unskilled at speaking. Again, he wasn't a good speaker. Galatians chapter 4 said he had some sort of a bodily ailment. Now, this is also a matter of much debate. Nobody really knows. Did he have some sort of disfigurement? Did he have something that, that you could see that, that made him unpleasant to look at? Or was he ill in some way? He couldn't travel. He would had to stay with them. And maybe while he was there in Galatia, he just preached while he was there. Maybe he was injured and so had some disfiguring injury from all of the problems that he'd had. He'd been shipwrecked and beaten and in prison all of that list of things, you know. But in Galatians chapter 6, it makes another interesting statement in verse 11. He said, I want you to note 
I want you to know that I'm now able to write large letters in my own handwriting. So he had had some kind of problem that had affected him. But, but look what God did. God took all of his weaknesses, all of his personal characteristics, and God used him anyway. We mentioned Moses. We would have to mention a young girl from the Old Testament named Esther who saved her people, an unlikely individual, a shepherd boy named David who slew a giant and, and became the greatest king of all of Israel, and a beggar named Lazarus who couldn't do anything, and they brought him to the gates, and yet he preached a sermon to a rich man every day. Every day. And then there were 12 unknown, unnamed, unlettered fishermen who probably talked like a lot of fishermen, you know? What is that old saying? Are all fishermen liars or do only liars fish? I don't know whether the early apostles lied or not, but they probably talked kind of rough sometimes. And yet Christ anointed them to serve him, and they began to work, and they literally turned the world upside down in their brief lifespans for the cause of Christ. God used the weaknesses all through his word. Personal characteristics are no impediment to him. He used them over and over and over again. And so as we think about that this morning, what about the personal concerns that you might have? The personal concerns that you might have. God Paul, uh, used Paul in spite of many things. You think, you saying right now, some of you say, I'm, I'm not worth much. I'm just not able. I, I can't do it. Paul said that same thing about himself. But he said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation of thorn was given me in the flesh. In other words, God's thorn in my flesh, whatever that was, and that's been debated for years as to what it was. A messenger of Satan, that's how bad it was. Paul says it came straight out of the pits of hell to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should be removed, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, faults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, I want to tell you, that's a tall order to pray right there. When you and I get to the point that we can kneel before Almighty God and say, God, I glory in you and you alone. And for the sake of Christ, I'm going to be content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Because when I am weak, then, then I am strong. All through the Bible, God took folks who were filled with weakness who would fill with imperfection, who said, Lord, I can't do this. And God said, yes, you can, because I can through you. And as we think in closing, I don't know what you were fighting this morning. I don't know what your problem is, if it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. God can strengthen the weakest and confound the strongest. He can do anything. The secret is surrender. Can God use your life? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. But your life must first be his to you. Are you really saved this morning? Do you know it? I mean, do you really know that you know that you know that you know? I'm not asking you if you've really been good. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you're a church member. 
But are you born again? That's what makes the difference. Are you fully surrendered? Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Anything held in reserve? Are you available to him? Or is life so cluttered with the stuff that comes to all of us? There's nowhere for God to fit in. That's what's happened to a lot. We could be used, but we've got so much clutter and so much junk and so much stuff. And there's no place for God anymore. I'm asking you this morning, are you willing to be used? He'll never force you. Never, ever. You must come to the place of surrender and willingness. Would you pray with me? Father, in this time of invitation this morning, as we've looked at all of these examples, we've looked at these who, in their weakness, were used by you. From so long ago to the Old Testament days, the days of Moses and Abraham, all through the early years of the Christian faith, even into our day today, you're still doing the same thing. You're still taking our weaknesses and making strength from it. But the key is total surrender. We must be yours to be used first. I pray this morning that someone may have seen the point of this entire message, that someone may have come to terms with that. Maybe someone here needs to be saved today. You need to come in repentance and faith and make public your profession of faith and then like these earlier this morning follow in the waters of baptism and be baptized in obedience to the command of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ maybe someone would come today and say I, I need to transfer my letter I want to move my membership to the Gillsburg Baptist Church I want to be a, a part of a fellowship like this love and work and serve reach out in this community minister to children, minister to senior adults, all the things that you have given to us, maybe you'd send us someone else to help us take up the load and help us move forward today. Oh, Father, we thank you and praise you throughout all of eternity if you do that. Maybe someone would come today and say, well, I don't know where my place of service is, but I know I need to be somewhere. Because when I look at folks like Freddie Gage and the Apostle Paul and so many other folks this morning, I'm ashamed of what I haven't been doing. I need to surrender totally today. So, Lord, use me. Here am I. Whatever the decision of your heart, maybe you just need to come and do business at the altar today with God. It's open always. You just come and pray for a moment. If you need to speak with one of us, Brother Austin's here. I'll be here. If you need to make public your profession of faith, you just come on. Wherever you are, we're going to wait for you. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this hymn of invitation. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, this is your invitation. You be pleased by what occurs in these moments. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Stand quietly to your feet. And as you do so, let's.